There is a mine. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the dark. Put an end to the darkness. They search out the far, the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. From far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which is which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Lap. Lapius and lazuli comes from the, its rocks, and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird or prey knows that, that hidden path. No falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it, and no lion prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock, their eyes see all the, its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. But where can, we, where, where, but where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot... It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, "It's." The deep says, "It is not in me." The sea says, "It is not with me." Cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought bought with the gold of Ophir, with precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it. Compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention. Uh, of mention, the price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of crush, crush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. Where does where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way of it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind the me and measures out the water, waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it, and he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. Okay, well, it'll be helpful if you have that passage we had read out, uh, Job chapter 28 in front of you. Um, just to bring you up to speed, uh, as we've been working through our Mining for Wisdom series, we've, we've kind of seen the great value of wisdom. Uh, as we live in this world where Satan exists, where there is suffering, if we don't have wisdom, we've seen we'll be shown up as foolish. And yet if we have it, uh, wisdom will lead us uh, kind of through the suffering uh, to that place where we come to find the better, more beautiful message uh, about Jesus Christ. Uh, and this afternoon, uh, I want us to consider the fact that I think our world in some sense kind of gets uh, that value of, of wisdom. Uh, you might have heard the saying that if you give a man a fish, uh, you'll feed him for a day. But if you uh, teach the man to fish, then you feed him for his lifetime. Uh, it's kind of this perspective, it's this piece of understanding that education is important. Knowledge and, and skills, they, they matter. Uh, having a trade or a profession uh, is worth something. We need wisdom. And so I want to move on today and kind of consider that question, 
how do we actually get uh, this wisdom that we've been considering through the book of Job? Do you just enroll in TAFE, uh, do the apprenticeship or go to uni? Is it just spending the money on the courses or the books? Or is it that we need to seek experiences? Uh, I was reading a blog post last year and uh, there was this man who was claiming that he'd uh, moved from reading five books a year to 50 books in a year and he said that that was kind of the, the thing that had changed his life. Uh, he just needed more knowledge. He just needed more information. Is that how we do it? And I know for some of us, we're, we're not book readers and maybe we're wise enough to know that in the end, wisdom is not just about information. Uh, we have to actually put wisdom into practice. It's about doing things and so maybe we need the time to think, to reflect. Uh, maybe the crucial uh, piece for us will be the kind of conversation with some other person who can kind of speak the words to us in our situation in life that will give us wisdom. And at that point, the Christian might kind of chime in and say, well, don't you just pray for wisdom? But I think the great problem can be for the Christian person, even the Christian who would say that, is that at the same time as they urge us to pray, when push comes to shove in our own lives, when we really know that we need wisdom, we might pray. But we do all sorts of other good things, like read the books and go to the courses and speak to people, which in the end can kind of push prayer off the agenda, shows us where we think wisdom really comes from. Where do you get wisdom? Is it that we do just pray this certain type of prayer, talk to the certain type of person, read the certain book? How do we go about mining for wisdom? Let's, let's pray, uh, and we're going to come and have a look at Job chapter 28 together. Oh, Father, we, we, we thank you that you show yourself to us. We thank you that you want us to have wisdom. And Lord, we just come to you and, and ask in your mercy that this afternoon you would you would give us wisdom, that you would help us to see you, that you would help us to know where wisdom might be found. And Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we've been working through the book of Job, we've seen that after the first two chapters, which really introduced the book for us, uh, you then move into the body of the book of Job, uh, which is made up of one half, which is kind of the dialogues between Job and his three friends. Uh, and then you get on to the monologues. Job speaks for an extended period of time. Uh, then a fourth figure comes on the scene, Eliphaz, uh, and speaks uh, for, a, again, an extended period of time. And finally, you have God uh, come and close out the section of monologues. And, and a few weeks ago, when we were considering the dialogues between Job and his friends, we, we kind of considered how Job's friends, they, they got to the point where because they just were saying the same thing over and over, they ended up running out of things to say. In fact, it's quite funny. If you look at chapter 25, Bildad, uh, in his third speech, uh, it only goes for five verses. Zophar doesn't even say anything. And it's at that point that Job begins uh, his monologue, uh, this middle section of the book. And it's interesting, uh, some scholars, as they look at what Job has to say, they uh, make the comment that really a lot of what Job says is, is kind of repeating what's already been mentioned. Uh, if Job was a song, it's almost like these chapters are something of a chorus, picking up the key themes, helping us to know what we should have taken away. And after church camp, we'll come back and consider uh, Job's monologue, but I actually want to focus in right on the centre of what Job says on chapter 28. Uh, that we had read out for us uh, previously. Uh, as we work through it, you'll see that it's very different from most of the rest of the book. There's none of the uh, emotional wrestling going on. It's quite detached, almost philosophical. And it's for that reason that I think the author of the book of Job has kind of inserted this poem in the middle of the book uh, to kind of clear the clouds for a moment so we can see where he's been, where he's going, what we're meant to take away from this book, uh, and of course, the clouds will clear again as we get towards the end and God finally speaks. But as you begin in chapter 28, which we're, we're looking at this afternoon, uh, it's fascinating because uh, given the industry that is around us, uh, the industry of mining, uh, it is actually picked up in Job 28 as an image of human ability. Uh, if you have a look in chapter 28, verse 1, it says, There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth, and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft 
in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Lapis lazuli comes from its rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. And if you just skip down to verse 10, one more verse, it, it says they tunnel through the rock, their eyes see all its treasures. And in these verses, uh, what we have, I mean, in one sense, it's, it's almost like you have a comparison. Uh, the endeavour for mining, as people dig in the kind of um, unseen places under the earth, looking for treasures, uh, precious jewels and stones, uh, it's almost like this comparison between Job's search for wisdom, as he digs through the suffering and the, and the dross of life that he is going through as he searches out for wisdom. Both are dangerous. Uh, both are kind of unpleasant both seek for treasure. But it's interesting when you do think about uh, the actual endeavour of mining. I mean, to think that people can find these precious stones in the dirt in the ground. I mean, for me, I kind of think, who, who was the first person who thought, if I dig down here, I'm going to find something precious? And yet, even back at the time that the book of Job was written, humans had figured it out. And it's interesting as you read on uh, in this section because actually mining is put forward as this endeavour which sets human beings apart from the animal kingdom. I mean, the Bible consistently says that, that humans are different uh, from animal kind. And we see that mining is taken as an example of that. Have a, have a look in verses 7 to 9. It says, No bird of prey knows the hidden path. No falcon's eye uh, has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it, and no lion prowls there. And yet, in verse 9, uh, people assault the flinty rock with their hands. They lay bare the roots of the mountains, and it goes on to talk, verse 10, about the treasures that they find. I mean, it's this picture in these verses that mining distinguishes humans from the animals. Mining is something that shows the ability of humankind. I mean, it is interesting, even if you think about our um, industry uh, around Mackay, the endeavour of mining. I uh, found that whenever I ask a bloke or, or girl for that matter who's been down underground and you get them kind of talking about that experience, their, their, their eyes kind of light up. It is just so amazing that we can do it. That you can drive for kilometres below the earth in these tunnels that humans have made. The magnitude of the machinery that is needed to be put down there to strip the coal, uh, the geological planning. Uh, that you take out these great seams and, and, and kind of don't totally destroy the ground. I mean, even the uh, ability to exist and survive in that place, the ventilation, the, the water systems, it's, it's quite amazing. And I think you do have to say that there is something special about humans, something that distinguishes the human from the animal kingdom. Uh, to push that a little bit harder, whatever your uh, belief about the human theory of evolution, I mean, if we take that theory uh, to mean that animals and humans are actually no different, well, the Bible would say at that point we have gone way too far. The Bible consistently puts to us that humans are given this special dignity, the ability to relate to God. They're not just material like the animals, and they're not even just spiritual like the angels. No, they are a mix of the two made in the image of God, able to relate to him. And it's on the back of that kind of ability, that kind of distinction between animals that we see in humans, that humans, I think, can tend to uh, think that we can achieve maybe more than we thought. Because what you find in Job chapter 22, that uh, just as soon as the poet who has written this poem kind of builds up uh, the great human ability shown in mining, in the very next verse he tells us uh, that humans cannot find wisdom. In verse 12, uh, the question is asked, it's repeated again in verse 20, uh, see it in verse 12, but where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? And just in case we uh, quickly answer and think that maybe in the dross and dirt of life we can actually find wisdom, well, the author quickly jumps in and lets us know it's a dead end, verse 13. No mortal comp uh, comprehends its worth, wisdom. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. You see, these verses say that you can't find wisdom in this world. 
I mean, people can study and research and think that somehow they will unlock the mysteries of the universe. But these verses say to us that that is an empty pursuit. I mean, there are those who will go on their spiritual pilgrimages, uh, the explicit pilgrimage to the spiritual place, uh, or that implicit pilgrimage, the, the gap year or the travel around the world or the caravanning tour to maybe find myself to understand this world and how I'm meant to live. These verses say, no, you will not find it. And what you see as you you keep reading through this chapter is that even wisdom cannot be traded for. We might not think in those kind of categories that we might try and trade for wisdom. But I think that for those of us who actually have money, I mean, we can't help but think in that kind of terms. I mean, we've got the money to pay for whatever book or whatever course we might like to go to. Uh, We've got the money so that we can relate to whatever person it is we think will give us the wisdom that we need. We've got the money to make the achievements and to bring the accomplishments that we think can leverage for ourselves wisdom. But now see what the the writer of this poem says in, in Job chapter 28. You cannot trade for wisdom, verse 15. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be bought with the gold of Ophir and the precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention. The price of wisdom is beyond rubies. The topaz of Cush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. And it's a fascinating section as it takes those very precious resources that by human ability and human ingenuity we've been able to take hold of from the dirt of the ground. And yet this poet in Job chapter 28 says to us that even with those, we cannot purchase wisdom. And just so we don't think that somehow we can suck wisdom out of the spiritual realm, yoga or meditation or speaking to some spiritual guru, the poet tells us that's a dead end too. Verse 21. It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumour of it has reached our ears. As you look to the heavens and try and seek for wisdom, it's not there, we're told. I mean, verse 22, that uh, language of destruction, literally that word is apollon, uh, sorry, abaddon. Uh, as you get to the New Testament, uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, we're told that Abaddon is uh, this kind of spiritual being who holds court over the abyss, the place of the dead, maybe even Satan himself. And yet this verse says to us that death, Abaddon, uh, wisdom is not in these spiritual realms. They do not have hold of them. And we see clearly that human beings, we do not have the, the ability to take hold of wisdom in this world. It's interesting, a few weeks ago I was uh, kind of searching around, I was trying to find these padlocks. One of the kids had this treasure box and they wanted a padlock to try and uh, lock their treasures inside it. And I was sure that I had a whole drawer full of them. I went searching through my study, uh, went to the garage and searched there. I looked under the stairs. No luck. I tried each of those places again. I extended my search. I went to the kitchen and the kind of garden shed. I even looked through the car. But in the end, I I couldn't find them. So frustrating. And I'm sure you've had that kind of experience. Well, what we're seeing in these verses is that if we think that we can get hold of wisdom by our own ability, if we think that wisdom is out there for us to find in this world, then we will likewise be frustrated. It is not there. It's interesting, another book in the... uh, Wisdom literature in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Hopefully one day we might get back to that book and have a look at it, mate. But it uses this repeated refrain through the book, meaningless, meaningless, to speak about human endeavour. Job's saying, if we think we can find wisdom in this world, that will be the end point. Meaningless, meaningless is all we will find. And I think on one level there is a great freedom uh, in what this chapter is telling to us. Uh, Because the thing is, uh, if we think that wisdom can be found here, it uh, it has this tendency to just uh, build this long string of things that we become afraid of. 
I mean, if I think that wisdom is, is going to be found by talking to this particular person or going along to this particular course or reading this particular book, well, then I've got to make sure I protect the time to get the wisdom from that particular source. I've got to have the money. Uh, I've got to uh, have the relationship with my family so that I can get the time to, to have that experience or, or seek out that wisdom. We become afraid of all sorts of things. But Job is saying to us, forget about all of that. It is a waste of time. Wisdom will not be found there. And so, of course, we've got to ask the question, where is it to be found? And it's fascinating, you probably picked it up even as we read through this poem, but just as, as bluntly as the writer of the poem tells us that wisdom is not found in this world, just as bluntly he tells us where it is found. God, verse 23 of chapter 28. You turn that up. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heaven. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it, and he confirmed it and tested it. It's this very clear picture that God knows where wisdom is to be found. It is in his hands. And really, uh, poetically, what this writer is saying, he is, he is telling us about the exalted nature of God. I mean, God sees everything. Can you kind of get your head around that? He sees everything. Now, the verses say that he, uh, verse, uh, what is it, 24 there. Um, he sees everything in the world. Verse 25, he, he established the force of the winds. L literally, he, he weighs the wind in his hands. I talked at the beginning of this series about the destruction that Cyclone Debbie has brought on Makai. I mean, they're just about to publish a book and put it on sale about the destruction that the wind has brought to our town. And yet these verses say that God holds the wind in his hands. He weighs them out. He is in total control. Uh, the waters, he goes on to talk about. Uh, he, he sees them. He, he knows them. He has measured them out, verse 25. I mean, you think about the depths of the ocean in the middle of the Pacific, uh, some 10, 11 kilometers deep, the, the megatons of water as they stretch into our rivers in, in this region. God sees them all. He holds them all. It is this awesome picture of God, and it shows us that God is the one who holds wisdom in his hands. And as you roll on through to the New Testament, I mean, it becomes very clear that God indeed is the only one who has wisdom. I mean, Jesus Christ as he steps foot in this world, as through the foolishness of his death on the cross, as, as Satan is allowed to touch Jesus, not just his body and his possessions like uh, with Job, but no, Satan touches his very life. And yet through that great foolishness, God shows his abundant wisdom. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 30 and 31, he, he, he reflects of the, on the wisdom of God shown in Jesus Christ at the cross. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. It says, Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He goes on, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's saying that Jesus Christ is God's wisdom. Wisdom is in God's hands, and it's in him that he has given wisdom to us. And it gets into a few details in those verses. You might have noticed he kind of unpacks that by saying that Jesus is our, our righteousness and our holiness, our redemption. I mean, it gets into the details. If you kind of miss that, it's, it's not the end of the world. But, I mean, see what Paul is saying here. He's saying that the deepest need of the human heart is righteousness. We, we search for that verdict of being right with God, of being someone of not kind of having to justify ourselves anymore. That's the deepest need of our hearts. And of course, in Jesus Christ, we have that freely. He dies on the cross. He, he forgives us our sins. We are declared in him to be righteous. That is God's wisdom. Paul says that we seek for holiness. We want to be special. We want to be different from this world. I mean, it's ironic to me that the uh, kind of atheist who would seek to kind of cut God out of the picture, who in a sense would put themselves in God's place in this world. 
then ends up at the place where they can't even distinguish between themselves and the animals. And yet in Jesus Christ, we are purchased back for God again, that we might hold that glorious place that God has given us as human beings under him, but at kind of the pinnacle of his creation. What we need is not uh, the wisdom in kind of books or experiences or study. No, we need redemption. We need to be purchased back for God, this God who holds wisdom in his hands. At home, uh, I have a, a, a gym set up. I'm quite happy with my gym set up at home, if you've, if you've seen it. Um, but I got the idea from the setup from my uh, brother-in-law. Now, it's kind of this particular brand of gym equipment that's kind of specially made for a home gym. I mean, when you've got a home gym, you, you kind of don't want something that's going to take up heaps of room. Uh, you don't want to be buying kind of 40 different dumbbells and kind of finding a space in your house for those. Now, you, you need a good setup. And, and this particular brand is virtually indestructible. Uh, it's lifetime warranty. It's, it's good stuff. But the one problem with this particular gym equipment as I was looking into purchasing it was that there is only one supplier in Australia, one shop in Sydney where I could buy it. And on one level, that made uh, the, the search for where I would buy this stuff from very easy. There's only one place you can get it. But of course, the problem with that is, uh, if you did something to offend that supplier or cut yourself off from that supplier in some way, then it's all over. And what we see here with wisdom is that if wisdom is in God's hands, if he is the only one who holds wisdom, then our great fear, our great anxiety, our great concern ought be that we may somehow do something to cut us off from the God who holds wisdom. And in fact, that's the very thing that we find at the end of Job chapter 28. If you just turn back there, hopefully you've still got a finger in that passage, the very last verse. We're told, what, what do you do with this knowledge that God is the only place where wisdom is found? Job chapter 28, verse 28. And he, God, said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To shun evil is understanding. And so, friends, this afternoon, I want to I urge us, I want to call us to have that kind of fear. To have as the great anxiety in our life, not that we might miss out on some experience or some uh, particular learning or knowledge, but to have as our great anxiety that we might somehow, in some way, be cut off from this God to fear him, to turn from evil, to not want to do anything that might jeopardize our chance of standing with God. Don't allow yourself to be lured in by other false claims to wisdom. Don't think that some human being has all the answers, the kind of perspective that you need. It is not that. In Jesus Christ, we have everything that we long for. Righteousness, holiness, redemption. And I do want to say, uh, kind of before I finish up, I I'm not saying here don't read the books. I'm not saying don't go to the courses. I'm not saying don't seek the advice or, or, or different experiences. Don't, uh, I'm not saying here don't observe the creation. I mean, that's kind of what wisdom is all about, looking at the world and trying to understand it. But what I'm saying is as we do those things, as we seek for wisdom, don't have your confidence in those endeavours. If you miss out on the book or you don't get to have the conversation that you hope for, who cares? Wisdom is in God's hands and he will give it to whom he pleases. Our great concern should be being cut off from him. And we began this afternoon asking that question, where do you get wisdom? Um, how do we go mining for wisdom? We've seen that humans, despite the great ability that God has given to us, it is not given to us to, to hold wisdom in our hands. It's not to be found in this world. Only God holds wisdom, and therefore we must fear him. And so I want to close by saying, uh, let's pray. Uh, let, let's seek God for wisdom. But as we pray those prayers, let's not kind of do it because we know that's what we're meant to do. But let's do it because we are utterly convinced that the only way we will have wisdom is if God in his mercy chooses to give it to us, as he has done so in Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which does uh, kind of clear away so much of the kind of confusion that we have to wrestle through day in, day out. 
And Lord, we do just come to you this afternoon and we pray that by your mercy, you would give us the wisdom that is in your hands. Lord, we, we, we recognize that you are the only one who has wisdom. And we pray that you would help us to, to grasp it from you and to ask of it from you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.